morning, family. Let's pray. Gracious God, we proclaim you to be a God of blessing. And so we ask in this moment that wherever we are and gathered and whatever it is that your people need, God, that you will bless. Where healing is needed, God, bless. Where deliverance is needed, God, bless. Where provision is needed, God, bless. Where reconciliation is needed, God, bless. Where faith is needed, God, bless. Where clarity is needed, God, bless. Where rest and restoration is needed, God, bless. Where freedom and liberation is needed, God, bless. God, and in blessing your people, God, allow us then to be conduits of blessing in your world and the prayers that we pray may bring blessing to those in our community who are steeped in the darkness of pain and distress. That our prayers will bring blessing to those in our state who are confused and weary of the decisions that they may make. God, we pray that the prayers that we pray may bring blessing to those in our nation, Almighty God, who are gripped by grief. And God, we pray that um, the prayers of your people might bless Almighty those in our world who are starved in so many ways, mind, body, and spirit. God, bless. God, and allow your people to just glimpse, to just taste in this hour, in this moment, sometime today, just how deeply they are loved by you. Allow us to feel and fully consume the feeling of what it means to be loved by an all-powerful and all-knowing God. Allow us to experience what it's like for you to delight in us that we may receive exactly what we need, that we might be blessed simply by your love. And so, Almighty God, grant this to us as we attune our hearts and our minds to say yes to you upon the hearing of your word, as we commune with you in the hearing of your word. May our worship also be prayer. In your matchless name we pray. Amen. Our passage of scripture today, as we continue on the theme of praying on purpose, comes from the gospel according to Luke chapter 2, verse, verses 36 through 38. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age, having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage. Then, as a widow to the age of 84, she never left the temple, but worshiped there with fasting and prayer day and night. And at that moment, she came and began to praise God and to speak about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. So I can remember growing up. And we used to sing a song that says, I'm going to run on to see what the end's going to be. And in it is this um, testimony that I'm going to keep on believing. I'm going to keep on hoping. I'm going to keep on anticipating that where all of this is headed is going to be worth seeing. Well, I think the spirit of this song shows up in our passage today. Our account takes place 40 days after Jesus' birth. Mary and Joseph take baby Jesus to the temple to be presented and to perform the customary consecration rites. And while there, a man named Simon, led by the Holy Spirit, comes to the temple and glorifies God. He blesses Mary and Joseph, and then he prophesies to Mary about Jesus and what Jesus will do. But at the same time, the passage says that a prophet and a widow, 84 years old, by the name of Anna, who was a member of the Asher tribe of the 12 tribes of Israel, also comes forward. She never leaves the temple, the account has said, or she has never left the temple, but worships day and night, fasting and praying. I want to pause to give a shout out to Elder Claymont for those of you who know him, because when I read this passage, I thought of him because it suffices to say that she was soaked in the spirit of God. 
she gives thanks to God and she speaks about baby Jesus to all present who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. Now, as I named earlier, Pastor Tanisha introduced the theme of prayer on purpose last week. And additionally, March is um, Women's Month. And we are about midway through the liturgical or worship season of Lent. So Lent is the 40 days leading up to the death, burial, and resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ. It's a time of returning to our first love, to God through fasting and prayer. It's a time of reminding ourselves how much we need God. So this passage does engage us in the effects of both fasting and prayer, but today I invite you to journey with me for just a few minutes as we stick with this prayer on purpose theme and as we think about keeping on. I believe in just three verses, we can see a depth and breadth of prayer worth considering in this account of the prophet Anna. So first, prayer on purpose transcends to being. It transcends to being. Have you ever witnessed someone receive a gift they didn't like, but try real hard to authentically um, be polite and grateful in response? You know, like, oh, thank you, right? All the scrunchy face. Communication is not simply what we say, but it's also what we do. It's body language, right? It's thought, it's action, it's bodily. I may say I love you, but if the way I treat you is not loving, then what I say is a mute point. Now, as we move through this point, I do not want to exclude or take away from intentional dedicated prayer time or um, alone time with God that includes prayer or whether prayer is in community, right? Like this dedicated time of prayer. Um, that does very much include our words and our language. But I want us to consider this in this point. Prayer is not simply what we say to God, but it is also expressed through our bodies. This is um, not a foreign concept to persons of African descent. In her book, Joy Unspeakable, Barbara Holmes notes that African spirituality does not dichotomize or separate body and spirit, but views the human beings as embodied spirit or inspirited bodies, so that the whole person, body and spirit, is involved in the worship of God. I simply wish to expand for some of us that our worship, our praise, our shout, the lament of our bodies, all spiritual practices to include fasting are forms of prayer. They are communion and communication with God, our creator. And how is communion and communication with God not prayer? All is prayer, right? All communication with God is prayer. And so we love God with our whole self, not just part. We therefore pray with our whole self, not just part. This is something to pause and take note of because as we lean um, on the wisdom of our ancestors, as we talk about more and more these days, we can also acknowledge that by praying with our whole selves, we also engage the DNA of our ancestors within our bodies in prayer. In this way, prayer then is always a community experience. So the next time you don't have the words of prayer, move your body as prayer instead or consider all the ways you engage God in a day as prayer. So Anna was in this temple day and night. This probably means she was in the physical space of the temple a lot and I know some of us you know we grew up going to church a lot so we can we can feel that we felt like we was at church every day or we were at church every day and then all day Sunday. But this passage says she never left the temple, but worshiped day and night. And so realistically, unless the woman actually lived at the temple, there's perhaps um, another message emerging for us in the line of this text or this particular line of the text. So if you consider, for example, 1 Corinthians 6, right, that says, do you not know that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You are bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Now, I will name that these verses have historically been used to um, 
create and undergird all kinds of rules and policies designed to control people's and particularly women's behavior and bodies, okay, through um, shame in ways that hinder, I believe, good communication and healthy intimacy. Um, and I think that the practice of using scripture in this way weaponizes a tool that is intended to liberate and just shouldn't happen. It keeps us from digging deeper. But with that said, what if this passage, at least in part, this first Corinthians passage is pointing us to an intimacy with God that is not bound just by intellect and spirit, but also a penetration of the body. It is a direct naming of the fact that God is not all is not only always present, but present within communing within us. When we um, we look at Anna or then when we see Anna as one who never leaves the temple, we too can embody that, that her prayer on purpose was not an event, but it was a way of being and existing. This is um, prayer without ceasing that we see in Thessalonians, right? In order to truly pray without ceasing, y'all, there must be an understanding of prayer that goes beyond conscious thought. Not that prayer that's conscious isn't prayer, it is. But it, there has to be a place where it goes beyond conscious thought, a way of being and understanding ourselves that throughout the day brings to consciousness the presence of the living God God around and within us. It's a posture of invitation to God to intercept, to intercede, to speak, to move, to touch, and so forth. Whenever God chooses, we use our intellect to enter into intentional space with God in prayer, such as like in prayer meeting or at prayer time. But while there, we re-invite God through the breath that we breathe, which I believe is the mark of the Holy Spirit on creation, right? We breathe God in and we trust that God will also answer the prayers spoken by any part of us, not just our minds, granting us perhaps what we need that extends beyond our language or our comprehension. We invite God into every facet of our life, mind, body, spirit at all times. Anna's example invites us to prayer as being, not just as an event. But second, prayer on purpose brings us proximate to power when we are vulnerable. Those who are most vulnerable in the world are often far more aware of their need for grace and for God than those who hold more privilege. We see this in several passages of scripture, but the one that comes to mind um, most for me is one of my favorites is in 2 Samuel. And it's when David embodies his praise, aka prayer, in full abandon of propriety and acceptability by dancing out of his clothes. I get an image of one in the moment who desires absolutely nothing between them and their creator. Well, Michael, David's wife and the daughter of Saul sees David and appears to be quite angry and humiliated by his actions, um, saying to him, oh, how the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, showing his tail, literally, <laughs> going around half naked in full view of the slave girls of his servants as any vulgar, she says vulgar fellow would, to which David replies, uh, it was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father or anyone from his house when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's um, people of Israel. I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this. I will be humiliated in my own eyes. But hear it, y'all. I want y'all to hear this. But by these slave girls, David says, you spoke of, I will be held in honor. Whew. I love this account because David appears to point out the fact that his privilege and the privilege of Michael is something they must both overcome in order to gain access to the intimacy those most vulnerable around them already realize they need in order to survive. He acknowledged that the slave girls, the slave girls, those 
um, in one of the lowliest stations in their culture would respect his willingness to offer himself fully to God without abandon, without um, regard to how he is seen or viewed because it was a reality that they were far more sensitive to. Now, I do not wish to convey a romanticizing of socially vulnerable positions. We must always press injustice to balance power in society. However, I do just simply wish to name that a heightened sensitivity to how much one needs God often comes with increased vulnerability. Not that the privileged don't need God just as much, but rather that privilege often makes it harder for one to recognize that need, which in my opinion, creates a far more dangerous um, spiritual position for folk. So when we look at the passage, Anna was not only a woman, but a widow. There is no mention of sons or other family. In fact, um, it may be worth noting that the tribe of Asher only had a remnant that survived exile. She is in this um, temple day in and day out. Who else is she in relationship with? She was by social standards quite vulnerable without an apparent male to provide for her and what appears to be even a limited number of extended family. But part of Anna's being is prayer. Her proximity to God via prayer and worship earned her the title within her community of prophet. This is a big deal. It's a big deal. Why? Because Jews of the time denied that any prophet came from Galilee. But here is Anna named prophetess in a historical time period when no man was named prophet. This reminds me of uh, uh, Jarena Lee and Zilpha E. Law and Julia Foote. They were black women who preached during um, and just after enslavement, sometimes in white spaces in slave states. So despite their vulnerability, there was this access that they had that defied logic. Y'all, when we offer our whole selves to God, it isn't just the strong parts or the parts we have together, but we offer our brokenness as David does in Psalm 51. We offer our fears as Mother Hagar does in Genesis. We offer our rage as Mary does um, after her brother Lazarus's death. We offer the vulnerabilities of injustice. Why? Because what some meant for evil, God intends for good, And that manifests here in this passage, because I believe it was quite possible that Anna's vulnerable social position in society enabled her to see more clearly her reliance on God, who is not bound by our limitations, nor crippled by the injustices that render us vulnerable in the world. In fact, we see in the few verses before this passage, a man named Simon who is led by the spirit to come to the temple for this specific moment. But Anna, Anna, y'all, the only named prophet of her time was already in the temple, was already in the holy place, was already proximate to holiness. She didn't have to travel to get to the holy place. She was already there. Prayer on purpose brings us proximate to power when we are vulnerable. But third and finally, prayer on purpose grants evidence of our faith. Faith is believing without seeing. More specifically, it is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things unseen. But for us today, we're talking about the evidence of things unseen specifically. So we're gonna lean into that part for a little while. So when I was growing up, my cousins would go away on vacation or when they were going away on vacation, they would always bring back a gift for my sister and I, a souvenir of some sort um, and vice versa. I mean, when we would go on vacation, we would do the same, but it became such a consistent practice that we would eagerly await their return without any doubt that there would be a gift, even if we didn't know what that gift would be. A part of the joy and excitement was anticipating something we knew was coming even if we didn't know what 
it was. Y'all, Anna comes forward, gives thanks to God, and speaks about the child Jesus to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. I read this version because these groupings of words in this particular translation of the NIV is so specific. Looking forward, okay, to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. Maybe some had come to the temple simply because they wanted the redemption of Jerusalem. They had wished for it, but Anna doesn't seem to be speaking to them. To them, Perhaps others may have been there um, and were looking for the redemption, seeking and searching in hopes that redemption might be found. Anna does not seem to be speaking to them. No, Anna was speaking in this translation to those who were looking forward. Looking forward means to anticipate with eagerness and pleasure. Hear this, y'all. I, I need y'all to, to hear this. As in, we don't just want it. We aren't looking for it in case it arrives, but rather we believe redemption is inevitable and we exist in the joy and anticipation of its coming right now. Anna speaks to this group and in doing so affirms with evidence what they had not seen, but believed to be so much so that they were re already experiencing pleasure from just the anticipation of it. She proclaims who Jesus is, what he will do, and affirms to those looking forward to the redemption that their eagerness is not unreasonable or naive, but justified because they were literally in the presence of their savior. I gotta give one more precursor. I don't wish to discount at all the importance of wishing and wanting or of seeking. We all have seasons of area and areas of our lives where this is true. But today the word in this passage for us, I feel very strongly, is where in our lives do we need to shift from wishing and seeking to looking forward? I have shared with um, some of you on a one-to-one -one basis that I have um, several visual prayer practices that I use with the purpose of moving and uh, moving from um, anxiety when it rises into the realm of anticipation. Prayer that guides me to release anxiety-filled situations to God in a way that clears the path for me to have anticipation of how God is going to work that thing out, how God is gonna show up in that situation. It sparks curiosity where there is doubt, awe where there is fear, peace where there is distress. Prayer on purpose calls us to look forward to the redemption we need because it's on the way. But there is one question that I have about the text that stumped me a little bit. If Anna is speaking to those looking forward, okay, those already anticipating the coming redemption, why was it necessary for her to speak this word to them specifically? I mean, wouldn't it have made more sense? Um, or wouldn't it have been more reasonable um, for her to speak to those who were on the fence or who were wondering if redemption might come? right? Well, consider this. What if the Holy Spirit moved Anna to speak to those looking forward to the redemption to provide evidence of the redemption they had not yet seen? Because if she didn't point it out, they would not have recognized it. <laughs> Y'all, Jesus was a baby at this time. OK, and his parents had brought him to the temple for a sacred rite that many in the temp, temp, many in the people in the temple would, would see done all the time with babies. Right. So this was like a, a, a very common experience. Right. So the closest example we might have is a baby dedication. Right. How many baby dedications do we see? I mean, I want you to just think about it. Who looks at a baby in an everyday context or a familiar context and says, 
Oh, this child will save. Who looks at a baby and thinks power? Who looks at a baby and thinks, man, I'm going to make my whole life on this kid. I don't know, but whose family is here to dedicate their life to God. I don't know. Maybe you do. Maybe you would. Maybe you got a special gift where you can do that. But I think most people would not look at a precious little baby and think these things. They were looking forward, but I imagine would never have thought that their expectation of redemption would come through the baby that was in the temple on that specific day. How might prayer on purpose be poised as a conduit to reveal a not so obvious source of redemption to you today. Prayer on purpose grants the evidence of our faith necessary to defend and justify our believing when we cannot see it. The evidence of faith in that temple was um, shoring up or refortifying the faith of those who already believed. It was a gift, y'all. It was the icing on the cake of faith, not for others, but for those who had been anticipating. And I believe it was in part so their faith would not wane. Um, the late Luther Vandross used to sing a song that said, if you can't be with the one you love, then love the one you're with. The irony of this verse is that if you are able to actually love the one you're with, then in truth, you end up with the one that you love. Where are you going with this, Donna? Bear with me. Y'all, faith steeped and saturated in prayer proves itself. Proves itself. Richard Rohr says faith is his own self-fulfilling prophecy. We start in faith not seeing, but somehow through the process of praying and believing, the evidence of what was once unknown becomes known. Anna's prophecy about the child was a marker to say, keep on believing, keep on trusting, keep on leaning, keep on loving, keep on hoping, keep on, keep on, keep on. Prayer on purpose is a way of being that brings power to our vulnerability and gifts us with the evidence that our faith is not in vain. Wherever you need to keep on family, keep on praying.